So welcome guys to this uh, first episode of this series called Chess with Wes. Um, I'm Wesley Volkow, as you know. Uh, I'm a national master at chess in the United States Chess Federation. And I'm also a follower of Christ. And I'm an extremely contemplative person. So when I play chess, I often, you know, wander about and I think about life. And I often see connections between my spiritual life and the principles that I that I know from my spiritual life, I see them reflected in chess. And um, that has definitely enriched my experience of chess. And I would say that playing chess has helped me appreciate some of these principles even more. So this is what I'm here to share with you. So there will be a lot of uh, chess content in these um, lectures, but there will also be a little bit of spiritual reflection about how I see spiritual themes at work in chess. So let's get on with it. Um, first, I'm just going to, for the sake of completeness, I'm going to show you some of the rules of the game for anyone who is watching and doesn't know the rules. So I'm just going to briefly go over the rules of the game and then we'll uh, move on to our first game that I'm going to show you. So let's pull that up. And... Um, Rules of chess. All right. Okay. So before we move, let's look at the the positioning of the chessboard. So the chessboard is always positioned with a white square in the right hand corner. So that's easy to remember. White on the right, and the queen is always positioned on its own color. So if the, if it's a white queen, it's on a white square. If it's a black queen, it's on a black square. And generally, you don't call them white squares and black squares, as um, generally in chess literature, you'll find them referred to as light squares and dark squares. And for example, this is a dark squared bishop, this is a light squared bishop, and so on uh, from the black side as well. Um, you see these letters down here, A, B, C, D, through H. Um, these are vertical columns. They are called files. So for example, this one would be called the C file and the horizontal rows are called ranks. So for example, this one would be called um, the fourth rank. And this square would be called C4. So that's how the squares are named in chess. So that one would be E5, for example. This is F3, this is H5, and so on. So whenever a piece moves to a certain square, so let's say I move this pawn here, I would say that the pawn moved to c4 and that's how chess moves are are annotated so that's how we keep track of um, we have kept track of chess games for hundreds of years um, this is modern notation but uh, they use uh, different types of notation before okay so let's look at the rules of the game so these pawns on the second rank and the seventh rank they can both move two squares or they could move one square if they wanted to so that's a choice that uh, either side has, ha has has that the pawns can be moved um, two squares or one square. But once they move, they only move one square at a time. And the same is true for black. You don't have to move a pawn on the first move, but generally it's a good idea to do so. You could, you could also bring a knight out on the first move, but that's not generally done. e4, okay, c5. Now white plays one move, uh, one pawn, one square up. Black does the same. Two squares. Now black can capture diagonally like this. The pawns always capture diagonally. Um, if black, for example, played this, then white wouldn't be able to capture straight like this. White always captures um, diagonally like that. Okay. Um, so c takes d, and now c takes d. Okay. Bishops move diagonally, so that's easy to remember, and they also capture diagonally. So if they wanted to capture, you could capture like this, right? Knight moves are L-shaped, so this knight can move in an L-shape like that, or it could move in an L-shape like that, or it could move in an L-shape like that. So a knight at the center of the board would have eight different L-shaped um, squares that would, it would move to. So let's say the knight moves to C3 in this case, okay? Um, and black does the same, moves the knight out. And the game moves on, white takes this piece diagonally, with the bishop. Now this bishop moves here, attacks the king. When you, whenever you have a direct attack on a king, it's called a check. And it's illegal to make a move that keeps your king in check. So if black, let's say, wanted to play this pawn up here, he wouldn't be allowed to do so. 
because you have to address the check no matter what. And so Black could play either move out of the check like this, or he could block the check with a knight. Generally, it's a good idea to block a check so that your king is not stuck in the center. You want a castle later on. So, okay, so takes, takes, game moves on. Queen. Queen can move in either direction, as many squares as she wants, except, of course, she cannot jump over pieces. None of the pieces can jump over any piece except for the knight, who, uh, which can jump over as um, any piece when it makes its L-shaped move. So queen moves here, okay, game moves on, castling. In order to castle, the king has to move two squares to either side towards the rook. So let's say if he castles on the left side, or called the queen side, it would be like this, or on the king side, that would be like that. The rook always moves to the square the king crossed over, okay? The other rule for castling is that if your king is in check, so let's say a black's queen was here checking the king, you couldn't castle. Uh, if the queen was here, let's say, observing these squares that the king crosses over, then the king cannot castle. If the king has moved before in the game, the king cannot castle. If the rook has moved before in the game, the king cannot castle with that rook. So these are some of the castling rules, okay? Here's another check straight to the king. So now black cannot castle because it's a check. So he blocks the check. White's bishop is attacked by this pawn, so he moves it back. Now black castles. And now the game goes on. This is an open file. It's an open E file, and generally rooks do well on open files. So white tries to double up and gang up on this open E file and indirectly keep an eye on these pieces here. Um, pieces can also move backwards except for the pawns. The pawns always move forward or they capture, but they never move backwards. But all other pieces, like this knight, can move backward. En person. This is a special rule in chess that if a pawn moves two squares, then the pawn next to it can capture it diagonally on the very next move. You cannot do it, let's say I play a move like this, uh, let's say black plays a move like that, and I play a move like this, now black cannot capture because the opportunity is gone. It has to be on the very next move that uh, the en passant happened. En passant in French means in passing. So it's almost as though this pawn was passing this pawn like that, and it was captured in passing. OK? And it's, this is a straight capture of a piece. White moves here. Black defends this bishop that was attacked by the queen. Whoops. Uh, white moves the knight here. Queen comes out, attacks this rook. So white moves it to safety. Black moves there. Now white moves the knight here, which attacks this queen, also attacks that rook. This is called a fork in chess, when a piece attacks two different pieces. Now you may say, okay, what, what if uh, I just take this piece? Well, then white would take the rook, and a rook is generally superior to a bishop and a knight, so you wouldn't want that to happen. So black tries a nice trick. He goes back here saying, okay, you can take this, but then, whoops, white drops his own rook, and now it's a check to the king, so he moves here, but then black gives a check here, and he moves back, but whoops, drops the knight as well. So that was a three-move tactic that, or a trap, which black had set for white, and he fell into it. Anyway, white plays here, sets another trap, saying, okay, you can take this bishop, but if you do so, you lose your queen. But black sees that, he plays this, solidifies this guy, and now the queen moves away from that pin on this bishop, so this bishop is free to move. So white takes this knight, black takes this piece, and now the game goes on for a few more moves. Black is able to consolidate his advantage and also win a piece and trade queens. And now it's time to bring the king all the way down so that you can promote one of these pawns and make a queen. When you promote a pawn to its last rank, you can make any piece, but generally you would make a queen because it's the strongest piece on the board. So now black employs a typical sacrifice and um, cleans up all of these white pawns and slowly but surely he is ready to push this pawn to become a queen be careful now if you play a move like this for example that would be stalemate in chess a stalemate is when your king is trapped but it's not a check and it cannot move anywhere as you can see it cannot take this pawn cannot move here cannot move there the pawn controls those squares and these two squares are controlled by the enemy king so you have no legal move but it's not a check. So that's considered a stalemate in chess, and a stalemate is a draw. 
in chess. So be careful, never put your opponent into stalemate if you're winning the game. So black is careful and he plays the move h5 so that once the king comes out here, it's no more stalemate. Black takes the square and makes a queen. And now the lazy way to win is simply make two queens and all, always keep checking and dragging the king in a corner like that. Once you've got him cornered like this, you give a checkmate with uh, both these uh, ranks or uh, files ranks covered the king has no escape and it's trapped and it's a check to this king and the king has no squares to run to so it's a check mate okay so that's a extremely brief review of the rules of the game now i'm gonna show you uh, a really nice game uh, with a nice story to it so the story goes like this it was a friend of mine um, named nikhil who texted me once on um, Facebook saying, hey, Wesley, give me some tips. I'm playing a chess tournament. And um, he said, I really want to impress some girls this time. And I was like, okay, I, I didn't say the same, but I was like, I, I didn't think that you would be able to do that with chess, but apparently I'm wrong. A lot of people then told me that, yeah, it's it's it can be impressive. So I guess uh, I got something going for me as well. But so let's let's look at this game. Um, that was played and it happened exactly as I had told him so this is the game I told him move the pawn two squares to d4 and I said his opponent would likely move the pawn to d5 which is what he did then I said move the pawn up to c4 this is by the way called the Queen's Gambit because this pawn is sacrificed immediately on the second move and also because this side of the board is the queen's side, whereas that side is the king's side. So this is for that reason called the queen's gambit. And I'd say I said here take that pawn, which is what he did. Then I said, okay, once he does that, you attack this pawn with this bishop like that. He'll defend that pawn. Again, exactly the same. Then I said, okay, move this pawn up here, attack the defender. This is a nice team in chess where you um attack the defender or remove the defender so you can then grab this pawn. So if black takes here, then white can take this pawn. And that pawn's gonna be dropping soon anyway. And what white has achieved from this is that he's got um, a nice central control. And it's in chess, it's generally a good idea to control the center in the beginning of the game because a side that controls the center has a greater chance of dominating or having more influence on the rest of the board. So that's the idea with um, controlling the center. So if he takes, he loses the center. So I said he would have to defend this pawn. But let's say he defends with this pawn here. What happens? Then I'll trade. He takes back. But then, whoops, he just opened up this line on this rook. And he's gone. So I said he probably might not do that. And he'll defend with this pawn. So that once you take, and he takes back, this line remains closed. There's a pawn here. The rook can't jump. And his rook is safe. Or is it? Because queen moves here and whoops, attacks the rook anyway. And it's not going to be saved this time. So this is exactly what happened in this game. And now his opponent realized that his rook is lost and he decided to sacrifice his knight instead because the knight is less valued. So he gave up the knight. My friend happily took the knight for free. He blocked the check with bishop d7 and now he's defending his rook. So that was his plan. But now my friend simply brought his queen back. He was up a piece and his opponent resigned due to embarrassment. <laughs> That's what my friend told me later. Um, and that brings me to um, the subject of this particular lecture, which is winning technique. Why would he resign? He must have known something that uh, white could do that would be an easy way to win and that's the winning technique that i'm about to demonstrate to you but there's another thing there's a there's a scriptural passage that i can think of that explains why he resigned in this position and so let me pull that up and i'll show you what i mean and uh, let me Okay, do you see my PowerPoint screen right now? Yeah. Okay, 
This is a verse from Proverbs, and it says, A man's spirit will endure sickness, but a broken spirit who can bear? And that's exactly what happened to this guy. He, his spirit was broken. He lost his fighting spirit because he lost a piece. And once he lost the piece because of his own foolishness, his, his spirit was broken, and so he could not bear it. And he was like, I'm out of here. I'm done because I can't, I can't bear this. And this is a huge psychological thing that happens in chess. So in this case, the sickness is like, is like losing a piece, right? But more than losing the piece, he began to feel down and he began to feel bad about the fact that, hey, I lost a piece. And that just made, that just broke his spirit, it crushed his spirit and he couldn't go on. There is a, um, there is a different passage which, uh, which says, the wicked flee when no one pursues, but the righteous are as bold as a lion. Now, of course, I'm not saying this guy is a wicked man, but I'm just making an analogy with the scriptural passage. And there's a nice reflection here that you might want to read from St. John Chrysostom. But what he says is that that's the nature of sin. Like when you, when you sin, it condemns you, it accuses you. And even when no one else is accusing you. So... Even if no one is pointing a finger at you, because you know you've done wrong, it's it's point your conscience is bothering you, and it's it's an accuser on your conscience. It always tells you, "Hey, you've done something wrong. You've done something wrong," and that makes the sinner a timid being. He wants to escape that situation because he cannot face it. He wants to flee. Whereas if you're righteous, then your conscience doesn't condemn you. You don't. It's not something that bothers you and says, hey, you've done something wrong because no, I haven't. And if I have, I have said sorry, I have apologized and I have, I have my conscience clear. But if it's not, then it keeps bothering you and it affects you. And that's what happens in chess as well. If you make mistakes, it's one thing to say to yourself, okay, we are all human, we make mistakes. And it's quite another to say, Oh no, why did I make that mistake? I'm so stupid. I'm so dumb. And when you start accusing yourself like that, you lose your fighting spirit and then you lose the game. I'm going to show you another example of a recent game played a couple of days ago. And I'll, I'll return to this particular game to show you the winning technique. But I want to show you an example of, um, of a game that recently happened. Uh, I played it online. It was a blitz game. So let's see. Let's open this one. And yes, I had this position. I was playing white in this position. And my opponent, this is a pretty level position, or at least materially speaking, it's level. All pieces are on the board. And my opponent played the move queen here, completely forgetting that he lost control of this bishop once he moved his queen here. And I just grab this bishop and I want a piece just like the previous game I want a piece and my opponent resigned the game I, I was absolutely stunned because I was like wait this position even though you lost a piece it's there's much to play for in this position for example he could take this pawn here then he could think of maybe attacking my queen like that and if my queen finds a way out the rook could come down here with this bishop defending that square and my king could be in trouble so all of these things were happening in the position for him. Besides that, there was a trap in the position. He could have played bishop here, and now my queen is completely locked in, in his own position. And next, he's just gonna move his rook here, attack my queen, and I'm gonna lose the game, or I'm gonna lose my queen. And uh, I did some computer analysis, and the computer shows that white would have to find this move, so that after this, you sacrifice your queen, and you win an extra piece and you can still fight with a lot of extra pieces that you've got and white is objectively slightly better in this position but by no means is black losing in this position on the spot but he lost that piece he was probably embarrassed that um, he made such a mistake and he just resigned the game um but why is that it's it's not merely because of the loss of spirit there is some there is a, a reason why now this guy is a strong player his rating is 2387 that's a really strong rating anything above 2200 2300 you're getting into serious territory uh, this is chess.com rating um, so he understands something about chess and he knows the winning technique and that's what I'm going to show you uh, what the winning technique is for such types of positions so let me go back to my previous game 
and show you what the winning technique is like. Okay, so we, we were in this position. Now what I did was, well, first of all, this move that my, my friend played queen to f3 in this position, it's, it's a slightly inferior move. And the better move is to play queen here so that this bishop is kept tied to the defense of this pawn. And uh, you can do a lot more with this queen here. So what I did was I put this position um, against a computer, uh, against a chess engine. I'll be explaining what chess engines are in more detail in the, in the future lectures. But I put this against one of the best chess engines in the world. It was Stockfish. Uh, as you can see up here, it says Wesley versus Stockfish 12. Um, and I played a three minute blitz game. I gave the engine three minutes to think for the rest of the game. I took my time. But three minutes is enough for Stockfish to come up with some really strong moves. But I wanted to test my ability to be like, um, can I actually win this game using the winning technique that I know against the best computer in the world or one of the best engines in the world. So okay, I played here. Stockfish moves its pieces. Now I bring my knight out here. He moves his knight there. I move my knight here. What am I trying to do? If you if you count the number of pieces, I have one, two, three, four. King, you can count it as a piece. Five, six, seven, eight. I have all my eight pieces on the board. Black has lost a piece, so black has seven pieces. So black has one piece less than I have. So it's an eight to seven advantage to me. If I reduce one more piece, then it becomes a seven to six advantage. If I reduce another piece, it becomes a six to five advantage. And that advantage becomes greater and greater as I trade off more and more of his pieces. So let me show you a slide that I made that shows this um, math. And uh, this, is, this is the slide which shows you the piece advantage. So as you can see, here it says 8 to 7 is 1.14, which is a 14% advantage. Not that great, but you can work with it. If it's 7 to 6, it's 17%. If it's six to five, twenty percent. If you keep trading, you come down to three versus two. It's a fifty percent advantage. And finally, if you trade off all his pieces and he's got only one king left, then you have an extra piece that's two versus one, which is a hundred percent advantage. If you plot it on a graph, it kind of looks like this. So when you have when you have traded maybe four or five pieces of your opponent, then your advantage really starts to shoot up and jump. So that's the winning technique. You start to simply swap off your opponent's pieces and leave him down to just one king left. And then you have an extra piece against his king. And that's easy to win. So let's see how I managed to do that against the computer. So I played this knight here with the idea of taking this guy out. And thanks to my queen being here, this guy is unfortunately pinned to the defense of this pawn. It's a, I call it a defensive pin. And he cannot move back because then he'll drop this pawn here. So the computer said, okay, do whatever. He moved, he made a nice move here. His idea is to move this knight here, hit my queen, and then move the knight here, give me a check, and also take my rook. So that's a deep plan by the computer, but I saw it. So I blocked that move knight to b4 with this bishop move here. So if he comes here, I'll just take it. Okay. So he moves back, attacks my queen, but I just move my queen to safety. And now that he offers me this piece, I, I take it. And now I play bishop here, trading off another piece. This bishop cannot move anywhere. It's trapped, sort of, on this square. And I'll simply trade. So that's the advantage of having an extra piece. Because normally this trade would have not meant much. But because you have an extra piece, even a simple trade of a piece is to your advantage. Which means that you have more moves that you can make that can worry and upset your opponent. And, and reduce his chances of winning when you when you are up a piece. So I traded off that piece as well. In addition, I, I I watched this square. So now his king cannot castle. Remember, I explained the rules of the game that if if the the king's square is covered, he cannot castle. So black had to find a way to get this king to safety and also to get this guy out and working in the game. So the computer sacrificed a pawn to distract my queen. I took it. He took my rook, I took it back, I'm happy because I traded a rook and I won a pawn as well. And he could have castled, but he made this move to bring his queen here, potentially hit my knight, come inside here. And so I had to be watchful, I stopped that idea with pawn here. So I, I watched this square now, and now he castled. And now I need to get my king away to safety really fast. So I played here, 
and uh, he attacks my queen, I move it back, and now I'll castle. And what I have here is, is a lot of time to execute my plan, because my plan is simple. I'll just swap off your pieces, and then I'll be left with an extra piece, which is this bishop. So if I can, I want to trade off these queens and this, both these rooks here. And he has to find something concrete to generate some sort of counterplay. Otherwise, I'm just going to move my knight here, challenge this guy saying, do you want to trade? And he shouldn't have, but the computer doesn't have that kind of understanding. So it said, OK, you can take my knight, but I'll get these two pawns going. Uh, but I was like, that's not going to be enough for you because I'll start undermining. This is called a pawn chain like this. And so in this case, this is a pawn chain, d5, c4. And the way to undermine a pawn chain is to attack the pawn chain at its base. So this is the base of the chain. So you attack that uh, chain there, and you start to undermine these pawns. He moves this queen back to defend. And I just make a preparatory move with this rook here, because I know this pawn's going to go at some point. So this rook behind the passed pawn is a strong force, because it makes the pawn stronger as it moves further and further. Okay. Now I took it, he moves the rook, attacks my bishop, move it back. And now I played a move which is a typically human move, but it's not hard to see for a human being. I sacrifice this pawn so that after he takes, I can move my queen in like that, offer a trade of queens. And if he refuses, if he goes back, then well, I've got my pass pawn going, I'll start pushing him. I can also take this guy. But if he doesn't, then I trade queens and I take out his most important piece, and then it's his rook versus my rook and my extra bishop. That's gonna be a huge advantage to me. And the computer was like, okay, I'll at least win your dangerous pawn like that and give you my queen. So I was like really happy because now I grab this pawn and thanks to this bishop watching that pawn, I grab that guy as well. There's one thing that I didn't mention in my previous slide, which I'm gonna show you in my next one is is the um, the relative value of pieces so if you look at this slide um, it shows you the generally accepted value of pieces so the queen is worth nine pawns generally speaking and the rook is worth five pawns and those two are called the major pieces the bishop and knight are both generally worth three pawns and they're called minor pieces the king is not valued in pawns usually but for the sake of our calculation, I'm going to say it's worth three pawns because it's effectively as good as any any other piece, any other minor piece. And if you use this calculation, then the math looks like that because now you add up all of the values of your pieces. Note that black is three points behind because he lost a piece. So I have one extra minor piece. So I have 34 to 31, which is about a 10% advantage. Then I trade a minor piece, becomes 11%. Trade another minor piece, becomes 12%. Trade a rook, okay, jumps a little bit, 15%. Trade a minor piece, becomes 18%. Trade the queen, jumps from 18 to 38. So that's exactly what happened in this game. Because you see, as long as the queen was still on the board, my advantage, even though it was good, it was not that good. But once I traded off his extra queen, that's it my advantage just shot up like anything. And then now if I manage to trade off his extra rook as well, I'll have a two to one advantage, which is 100% advantage. So that's the, that's the winning technique that I'm employing in this game. So I already managed to trade off his queen. Now if I, if I can get this guy swapped off, then I'll have this bishop and my king versus his king, which is an easy piece of cake win. Of course, the computer is not gonna let me trade it off because it understands that um, that's just completely losing. But we s shuffled around a little bit. I realized it. So I offered a trade of rooks, saying, OK, you want to trade rooks? The computer refused, and rightly so. So I understood that it's not going to freely give me this rook. So I have to do something. And what I did was I actually sacrificed my rook, saying, you can take my rook. I'll take yours. You take my piece. I give you my extra piece. But now I have th three pawns, and you've got two. And this is an elementary endgame win. Of course, you need some technique, but I went on to win um, rather comfortably. I shouldered off, it's called, this technique is called shouldering off your opponent's king, and I captured the second pawn as well. 
And then I simply went on to promote my pawn to a queen. And then the winning um, method with the queen is simply to trap your opponent's king in a box. So this is a large box that the queen is trapping this king in. And as the king moves, you start uh, you start making the box smaller. So now the box is um, smaller. So if you go here, now the box is this one. And once you get to the last rank, now the king can only move like this. Don't, don't move here, it's going to be stalemate. But now you can simply bring your king along and give check mate like that. So that is um, the general winning technique, and which, which explains why. And it, it's so easy to do because I managed to do this against the best computer, uh, one of the best engines in the world. So it's not that difficult to achieve at, at master level. But the first game that uh, my friend uh, played, they were not masters. And his opponent should have played on in that game because, hey, it's one thing to be playing a master. It's quite another to be playing a player who you know is po he potentially can make a lot more mistakes than a master would and he would he should have played on in that game okay um now i'm going to show you um this same winning technique demonstrated by a grandmaster and his name is um Vishyanan. Vishyanan was a five-time world chess champion and i'm going to show you how he used this winning technique in one of his games so this game was against a grandmaster named Smirin, and the opening moves are not relevant to our discussion, so I'm just going to skip through that phase and get to the, the point that's uh, relevant here. Anand was black in this game, and at this point Smirin decided to sacrifice a piece. So this piece was attacked to knight on e5, but Smirin thought that he could take here, and after he takes he could take here, and now that this knight is pinned to the king with this bishop. Smirin thought he would probably able to, if not win this knight, generate some pressure and and get a better position. But Anand defended that knight with this bishop here, and now he takes the pawn here, and Anand moved his king out of that pin of the bishop. So Smirin played here, and now Anand first played rook here, attacks the queen. Queen moves away, moves his knight here, and attacks that pawn with these two pieces. So black, so white played this move here. And now Anand played a really great sequence of moves. He played rook here first, queen moves back. Now he sacrificed the exchange. This is called an exchange. A rook for a bishop is a major piece given up for a minor piece. So that's an exchange. He sacrificed it. Queen took, but Anand's point was bishop to d3, defended by this knight, which attacks the queen, also attacks the rook. So he's going to win his material back. And now he played another really beautiful intermediate move, which these, these kind of intermediate moves are the hallmark of a great player. So he gave a check first, so that after the king moves, he can take the knight, uh, take the bishop, swap off another piece, attack the queen, so he has to take, now take the rook, take that, and take the pawn. So in a series of uh, just a few moves, he swapped off all these extra pieces like that. And now he's left with the rook and queen and his extra bishop, which would make life simpler for him uh, to win this game. And I'm going to show you a video of this game. And uh, let's have a look at how that happens. So are you? I hope you're able to see my screen here. Um, this is my YouTube video. Are you able to see this? Yeah. Okay. So I'm gonna I'm gonna hit play and uh, call this a shootout both sides. So look at the clock here. This is Anand's clock. Anand's playing black. His clock says two minutes and three seconds. So let's see how much time he takes to execute this plan. Okay. Guns come out blazing and now making sure that no attack happens. And Anand has sacrificed the bishop in the middle, but of course he would gain that queen. And he sacrificed his rook, his rook for the bishop, and now he's attacking. He's okay. attacking a rook and a queen. This is fantastic battle going on so here. The reason he's done that is to trade off pieces. There you go. He's just trading more pieces off the board. And it seems he's about to win not just one pawn, but two. He's ripping a rook. No, in fact, he's only going to win one pawn, and he's up.
You see, 203 and 152, that's only almost like 11 seconds. But within 11 seconds, he was able to see this and he just swapped off. And, and you see the commentators were agreeing with this idea of trading off pieces because he's got an extra piece. So that's, that's the winning technique that he used in this game. But I must, I must show you a game of Anan where the flip side of knowing the winning technique is that you can your spirits can be down because you made a mistake and you know your opponent also knows the winning technique so let's look at a game of anan where um, that happened um, i'm gonna pull this up here and in this game in this game anan was playing black and so this is what happened in this game white took a pawn this is called the Petrov defense, so it's symmetrical. White moves the knight here, attacks this pawn. Black moves the knight here, attacks that pawn. White takes. First he kicks his knight back, then he takes. And white moved his knight here. And Anand, he, he had a momentary lapse and he, he forgot something. And he just quickly moved his bishop here, which is not the move that he wanted to play. He, he missed... Um, he mistook it for some other idea that he wanted to play. That's what he clarified later on. Uh, but anyway, he played here. And now his opponent played the queen to e2. So why did he move the bishop here first? First of all, because this knight is attacked, so you can take it. So he moves the bishop here, so if you take, he just takes back, right? But his opponent plays queen here. Now the problem is this knight, unfortunately, is pinned against its own king. So the knight can't move because then the queen would hit the king like that. So the knight is unfortunately pinned. And so this knight cannot move. But if he, let's say, he defends, and now white can, if he, let's say, plays a waste move like this, then white will just take, takes back and uh, win an extra piece. So black has to find a way to save this guy and he cannot move it. So let's say he plays a pawn up here, right, like that. But then white can simply use the pin to his advantage and say, now I'm going to take you with the pawn. You still cannot move the knight. Your knight's going to be doomed. So that's the problem. So there can be a trick to save the knight like this, because now the knight's no longer pinned. The queen is in the way of the king. So knight, now this knight is free to move. But the problem with this is that white's knight can move here, and now it hits the queen as well as this pawn. So the queen has to watch both these things. So let's say the queen to watch this pawn moves here, but now the knight is still pinned to its king because the queen moved away and white can play this and win this knight. So due to this, Anand saw this and he resigned the game on the sixth move. A grandmaster resigning uh, just six moves into the game. His opponent was not a grandmaster, but he was close to being of grandmaster strength and um, to be fair to Anand a little bit, I would say that um, quite a few people may have resigned in this position because he, they know that their opponent knows the winning technique and it should not be too hard for them to find it, especially with a lot of time on the clock, which his opponent had. It was not a blitz game. It was a regular tournament game, probably two hours on the clock. Uh, maybe even I had, a, I had a chance of beating Anand in that kind of position using the winning technique. But I, I did the same exercise again. I played this same position against Stockfish just to see if I could demonstrate the winning technique again. So I'm just going to quickly run through this now because I showed you the technique before. And uh, okay, now Stockfish decided to ignore this knight completely and give it to me and castled. And I played here defending because I want to get these pieces out because his idea is going to be bring the rook down here and then start to watch my king like this. And he's going to counter pin me on this file. So I got to watch that and get out of this situation as soon as I can. So first I defend this knight so that now my queen is freed from the defense of this knight. And then once he does something like that, I can move my queen back, get this bishop here. So then the bishop would be blocking that line and he would not have a check on that line. Stockfish played here and then I took a timeout and be like, I wanted to play bishop here, but then I was like, I don't want him to get some strong central pawns here like that. So I played this pawn up here. And even though I conceded what's called a hole in chess, now a hole is a square to which your opponent's pieces can easily move to because there is no pawn to harass those pieces. So there is no pawn on this square 
or that square to harass black on if, if this knight moves to d4. But my point is that, yes, there's a hole in my position, but if you ever jump into it, I'll just take, take your piece. And remember, piece trades are in my favor because I have an extra piece. So I compensated for the fact that I have a hole in my position due to me having an extra piece. So I could make these kind of moves, which are not normally good moves, but because I have the extra dynamic of the extra piece, it allows me to make these kind of moves. Okay, so I, I took a time out to do that. So once he does that, I trade off his strong central pawn. And now I move my knight to safety. Queen moves back. Now I, I'm in time to get castled. And I offer him this pawn for free, saying, okay, you can take this if you want to. Uh, because if he does, then I'll be the happiest man. Because queen takes, he takes, I take, rook takes, and I'll swap off this rook as well. And what I have now is an extra piece, and I traded off his most dangerous piece, which is the queen, and then my extra piece should be able to exert, make its presence felt more in the game. So that was my plan, but the, the computer didn't go for this. It played b6, okay. I just ignored it, saying, you can take this whenever you want, because I have the trade in my favor. So we played some moves, and now, Again, the advantage of having extra piece is that you can simply start challenging enemy pieces on open line saying, hey, you wanna trade? And either he has to trade or he has to move away, but then he gives me the open line, so he gives me more control of the board. So that's the disadvantage of having um, one piece less because you don't wanna trade, but then if you don't wanna trade, you, you gotta make retreating moves and then you give your opponent more control of the board which in turn allows your opponent to do more with with his own pieces. So, okay, he swapped off that rook, and this pawn is still free for the taking if he wants to, but he didn't take it. He played here, I okay, move back, bishop moves back. I still offer him, so you can still take this. So now the computer tried this trick. Point of course being that if I take like that, then, whoops, my queen drops, and I take the queen, but he takes the extra piece. And now he's won his piece back, so obviously uh, that would not be good for me. But if I don't do anything, let's say I make a bad move like rook here or rook there, then he would take this pawn like this and defend it by one, two, three pieces in total and attack by one, two, three pieces. So the pawn is defended. Uh, because in order to take a pawn, you would need more attackers than defenders. And in this case, it's three versus three. And the bigger problem for me is that this pawn is a passed pawn, meaning that if these pieces are not in its way, then the pawn could start to march down the board and become a queen. So one of my pieces, at least one of my pieces, has to always watch this guy. So it ties me down to the defense of that pawn. So I didn't want that to happen. So I'm like, if you want to take this pawn, you're going to have to take it on my terms, and I move it here so that you don't get a passed pawn. You can take the pawn here, which he did, but then I get to swap off a piece. And now he should have taken with the bishop, but first, but if he takes with the bishop, then he loses this pawn. And uh, Stockfish is a is a program that that has a higher evaluation for material, so it didn't like the fact that it was losing a free pawn. So it says, okay, I'll keep the free pawn, so I'll take with my queen. But I'm like, dude, that's your queen. I'm just going to trade your queen. And remember that chart I showed you, where once you trade off queens, your advantage just increases. Um, exponentially. So that's what happened here. He traded the queen and then I offered a rook trade as well and the stockfish should not have taken this rook. He should have blocked it but the computer evaluated the position differently and allowed me the rook trade. And now it's clear that I'm winning because uh, these two pieces cancel each other out, almost cancel each other out and I have an extra knight in the position and that knight is going to make its presence felt sooner or later. So the game went this way. I'm not gonna show you all the moves here. I traded off some pawns. Again, I challenged his bishop. He has to move back, otherwise he trades pieces. So we maneuvered a little bit. Again, I offered a trade this time. If he doesn't take, then I take his pawn. So he had to give up the piece. And now he finally tried a nice little trick, which is bishop takes pawn here with check. And if I had taken that, then he would have moved the pawn here by he, I mean Stockfish, it's a, it's a program, but um, for ease of uh, use, I'm saying he. Um, 
and now this pawn cannot be stopped because the king can come back here it's controlling that square and these pieces even though I have three extra pieces they cannot come to the rescue of white's position and this pawn is going to become a queen next move so that was the trap but I saw it and I moved the king towards this pawn so I'm like all right I'm gonna take this pawn and now it's two pieces versus one piece or three person three versus two and I maneuvered like this took an extra pawn and now I began to play on both flanks and his pieces cannot defend both flanks he has to run around trying to hold one flank his king moves there but then I start playing on the other side and his bishop goes there but now the knight's gonna come here and win that um, pawn uh, the piece anyway so he gives it up for this pawn but now I queen check here always be careful of stalemate in such situ situations so for example in this position bishop g3 would be a dangerous move to play because now the king is trapped and if he's, he's only got this move here pawn to e5 but then if i play something really stupid like king takes pawn then his king is stalemated the king can't go anywhere that would be a draw so always make sure that your your opponent's king if you're checkmating him has breathing space to move so that it's not stalemate so once you've got him on the last rank like that pinned by or, or blocked by the queen don't move your queen uh, unless your queen's on a square where it's completely cutting off the king now simply move your king close to the king and then you can give checkmate like that so that's um, the winning technique um, now I'm gonna show you a game where one of my opponents had an inferior position and he knew that of course I know the winning technique but he didn't give up he kept fighting and uh, that's the kind of attitude that you should have when you play chess that as long as you have the ability to fight why not fight and give it a shot because it's not like let's say you're a boxer and your right arms hurt but you can still swing it occasionally why not try it unless you want to be like oh I want to save my arm so I'm not gonna fight and okay but that's not a perfect analogy for chess but uh, you get the point I'm making which is that if you have the, the ability to fight if you can throw some punches then might as well stay in there till all hope is lost um, and that's what my opponent did in this next game which is which is uh, quite amazing I must say he despite um, having a disadvantage he fought on really well there's a there's a nice story about this game which I'm gonna tell you it was um, it was played in the millionaire chess tournament in 2016 and this was the eighth round my opponent was Levy Rosman he's uh, now nowadays he's a, he's a very uh, popular streamer on chess but in those days he was not uh, he was rated 2354 at that time he was a fide master um, and he was trying to get his international master norm in this tournament um, and my, I was rated 2142 so I was clearly the inferior player in this going into this game but hey it's a game and um, um, who knows on a particular day you can even beat a grandmaster um, in this tournament I played a few grandmasters I didn't manage to beat him but I'm I drew all my games against the GM so that was a good accomplishment for me and the story going into this round is this is round eight and it was a nine round tournament and um, I had already played seven rounds with only one win and two losses and um, and the remaining were draws of course these were all really strong players so I wasn't too unhappy with the result but I was like, I was, I was, uh, this was the morning, I was in my prayer time, and I was like, Lord, can I actually win a game cleanly? Like, I want to win, not because my opponent made a really stupid mistake, but I want to win because I played really well. And of course, you need your opponent to make a few mistakes, but not a blunder which one of my opponents made, and that's why I won the game. So that was the background to this game, and I showed up to the tournament hall, and uh, they have a list of pairings where they show who you're gonna be playing with and my name is not on the list I, I'm just stunned I'm there's the, the, like more than a hundred players playing in this tournament and I'm not paired with anyone I don't have an opponent for this game and I was absolutely stunned by what just happened how did this happen like you guys are supposed to be using computers to do this pairing so how 
was the program not considering my name for the pairing and I spoke to the organizers uh, or the registration desk and they're like we'll give you a free point for this round but I'm like no I want a game I don't want a free point I want to play a real game and it so happened that uh, when this was happening Levi Rosman who I knew by the way I played two two games previously with him so I kind of knew him uh, was pass pass just passing by and as he's like what's going on dude so I told him the situation and so he knew about it and he went inside and uh, the game started and I was left outside and um, so okay I went into another room I started playing some blitz chess friendly blitz chess with someone and about an hour later or hour or more later Levi Rosman comes out he's looking for me because the same problem has happened with him he's not got an opponent and he's the only guy I told about my problem so what a strange coincidence uh, to this game so they they brought us both together and then they set up this um, this game between us with a shorter time control because we had already lost an hour or more of play so now I got to play white in this game and so game on so I played pawn to e4 Levi Rosman played e6 and d5 which is the French defense I'm not going to go into the theory of this defense for this video but I'll get to the the point um, of the struggle so we, we shuffled around initially these are all not so this pawn even though it's it's lost temporarily it's only temporary because he can he can take it at any point so um, I decided okay there's no no point hanging on to this I move my knight here making room for my bishop to come out so this is about um, your piece activity and mobility you you don't want to have your pieces sitting at the back rank not doing anything you want your pieces to um, be as freely movable as possible so that's what I'm trying to do your the greater your mobility the greater the chances that you would be able to coordinate your pieces to be able to achieve a more concrete objective so that's what I'm doing with that move trying to get my pieces out so he finally okay he trades this guy out and he wins his pawn back now I could have moved this bishop here but first I decided again the principle of mobility I don't want him to have an easy game so I moved this pawn here why because it takes away a crucial square from his pieces because this knight could have moved here later could have jumped here but now that I took it away from this knight it can't move there um, the queen would have wanted to come here maybe and you know pressure on this line against this knight but that move stops that as well um, Another thing that this move does is that it leaves this pawn a little bit lonely because if black, for example, I played a move like this and if, let's say, not in this position, but let's say black had a move like that, then this pawn is well protected with that um, friendly pawn. But by this move, I stop all of those ideas as well. So this is a really um, um, important move in the position. It takes away a lot of your opponent's chances but I had to weigh it against all of my other options because normally you want to get your pieces moving out first and your king to safety before you make pawn moves like that. But I, I evaluated the position and, and I said, look, I've got a well-placed knight, which is slightly better than his knight. I've got a well-placed bishop, which is probably as good as that one. And he's not got anything else going for him, so I can take a timeout and make a side move like that just to achieve a more long-term objective so I you see how I evaluated the position I assessed it and said okay I can make an exception and be like I can take some time to make this important long-term move because he doesn't have anything in the short term okay castles bishop comes out here queen here and so that move queen there you see the queen would have wanted to come here but uh, because I stopped it he had to move it elsewhere so he moved it there but that was already a mistake because I was able to move this knight here, attack this queen, and now the queen is running out of square, so the queen had to go here. But now I take this piece, he takes it back, and now I win this pawn. You see, that pawn which I had kept lonely just a few, few moves ago, I was able to win it with this little combination, as it's called in chess. But anyway, the game's not over. He lost a pawn, not a piece. And um, even though he's lost a pawn, he's got an open line for his rook to work with here so he can start some counterplay and he did exactly that attacking my knight so I defended it now with this 
and immediately he played this pawn here to create more counter chances for him because now if I take this pawn then he'll I drop my piece so that's not that's not good um, so he's clearly trying to stir up the pot a little bit because he's got open lines and my king is still in the center so if if your opponent's king is in the center it's a good idea generally it's a good idea to open lines against it um, so that his pieces like his rook can start working on this line really fast so I had to watch all of that so I first of all I saved this piece because um, this knight is watching this bishop and um, I assess that this piece is more important than this knight because if he swaps this guy out let's say I play a move like castling and he swaps that guy then his bishop is going to be on this line and he's just going to be the king of this diagonal there's no one to oppose that bishop and that creates huge problems for me because let's say I have my knight come back here sometime then his queen could join in and have this battery down on my king and in fact that would be threatening checkmate in one move with that kind of a situation so I didn't want this bishop to be uh, unopposed during the whole game so I was like I need to keep this guy around just because he's around and I'll trade those guys if need be but as long as he's around he can be nullified so I move this bishop here first not allowing that piece trade so queen comes out here now I cancel now he brings his rook here so he's trying to work on this d file creating pressure down here so I move my queen out of that situation and then he took this pawn and instinctively I wanted to just take it back because that's so obvious he takes your pawn you take it back and my, my hand was almost in the air like this I was just about to reach for the pawn and make the move but then I remembered something I told myself during this tournament that wait don't make the obvious move don't make the obvious move because it's so easy to make the obvious move and then start thinking what did I just do and sometimes you can miss opportunities because you were blinded by the obvious move and you just made it without even thinking so I, I thought and he probably also thought that my capture recapture is pretty obvious so he didn't think too much about capturing the pawn but I had a move in this position which was rook from a1 to d1 which is what I found because I stopped myself from making the obvious move I guess that's also a life principle um, because sometimes you can be like oh yeah it's so obvious I'm gonna do this but hey if you have the time just think through your choices and uh, make sure that your obvious choice is the right one or or make sure that there's not a better choice that you missed out because you just made the obvious one without even thinking um, so I made to move the rook here now he's in trouble because now my rooks attacking his queen right and my rooks defended so he cannot take it if he moves back let's say here right then I would take on d8 you take back and then I'll play knight here I would fork these two pieces and then I'd win an exchange and then using the winning technique which I demonstrated I would start swapping off his um, pieces and then my rook would be left against one of his minor pieces and that would be a winning endgame for me so he saw all of that and he realized that there he has less fighting chances in that kind of situation than he has if he gives up his queen but instead gets my knight and my rook in return so that's what exactly what he did he said okay you can take my queen I'll take your knight and I'll take your rook as well so that's a nine for eight trade but he was like I have more fighting chances in this position than if I save my queen but lose my rook so that was a that was a really bold decision from him and a, and a correct one I would say because the game is quite tense um, okay so I took this pawn and now uh, he moved the rook here he's attacking this guy he's attacking my bishop which is defended by my queen now well, my queen's extremely awkwardly placed here it's it's in a defensive pin trying to hold on to this extra piece or, or this piece and in the meantime he's attacking my pawn his bishop can come out here all of his pieces are extremely active his rooks active on the d-line so I was like I gotta do something quick or he's gonna get his pieces mobilized and I'm gonna be in huge trouble so I said I'm gonna have to open up line so I played the pawn up here um, and he took it which was he he missed he missed a, the trick that I had in mind because I played the pawn here 
Now he blocked it. He, if he takes it, then I just take, I trade more pieces. More than that, I open up his king's position, so that's not, that's not good for him. So, but his plan was here, and after I take, he goes here, defending this rook, and now his point was that he's attacking my queen, and um, my queen, unfortunately, is tied to the defense of this guy, so if my queen moves away, then my bishop drops. So that was his, his plan with that uh, sequence, but he had missed a move, and the move was rook here, which I found. Uh, which, which I found before I make, made that move. The point here is that if he takes my queen, then I give a check on the back rank. This pawn is defended, so he cannot take it with, because the bishop's watching that. So he has to come up here, but now I queen here with check defended by this rook, and this is actually checkmate. So that was the idea with that move. So he couldn't take my queen, he blocked that check. But now with that rook move, from here to here, I created a square for my queen to hide, and so I moved my queen back to that vacated square. And now he, okay, he's, he realized that he had to keep fighting, so he moved the knight here. And um, I found another interesting move. I played queen takes pawn, same idea, because if he takes, then I move the rook back here, and it's gonna be checkmate. So that was too much for him, so he took this, uh, bishop instead and I was happy to swap off this guy and now this rook's gonna get swapped off as well so I took there he took back and now I have a queen versus a rook and a knight so I have a nine to eight advantage here but also the more important thing is he's got a loose pawn here and I've got a pawn which could potentially go on to become a queen this pawn can also do that but he is more easily blocking this one than that one so I decided I want to go after this guy so I sacrificed this guy, he took it, and now my queen entered, attacking this guy and this guy at the same time, and he couldn't defend both. So he took this pawn, and I, oh yeah, this is a nice, I could have um, taken this pawn here, but what I was worried about is this rook coming down here, check, now my king has to come out into the open, then he has moves like knight check here, knight check there, my king has to come out in the open again. I was not comfortable with that idea because it's with a knight moving around like that your queen could be in trouble and so on with forks and stuff so i said no i, I don't want to go into that position it's a it's also a spiritual principle called uh, avoiding the occasion of sin which you may have heard um a lot of priests often in confession they tell you avoid the occasion of sin so this the king coming out into the open is like the occasion of sin sure you can play well and still go on to win but you are willingly exposing yourself to some dangers. So let's say, let's say someone's a compulsive gambler. For him to go to a casino would be to go to deliberately put himself in an occasion of sin, thinking that hey, I can I can show self control. But that's that's a dangerous um, thing to do. As um, there's a scriptural passage that says. Um, let me share that with you. It says do not make room for the devil simple simple principle but it's it's also true in chess that you do not want to make room for um, uh, the devil in in these kind of positions so I played here pawn to h3 so that when he gives me a check here I can hide here and not come out into the open so that was the plan so he started playing with h5 he's got an interesting idea of his own so I took here, he checked me, so I went here as planned, and now he played h4. Now his, he's got a pretty interesting plan here. So let's say I move around aimlessly like this. He'll play knight there, then bring the knight here, and now he's threatening checkmate on h1 with this knight and this defending pawn. So that's his plan. So he's, he's still fighting. I've got an extra pawn, I've got a queen, but he's still fighting. So I gave a check first, and now I calculated that he didn't have the time to get that working so I played the pawn up here because now if he let's say he tries knight there I can move the pawn here then if he goes say here then I can give him a check and once he moves I can pick up the rook on the next move so I, I saw that he doesn't have that trick and he saw that too so he played the pawn here now he's got a different trick he's gonna move his pawn here and checkmate me like that 
So you see how he is still fighting all the way till the, to the bitter end because he has something to fight with. And so I saw that. And let's say I let's say I play a pawn move here, and he goes there, and I take that pawn. What happens? Then he'll take my king comes out here. It'll give me a check here. My king has to take the pawn here. It gives me a check here. King has to move here or g5. And it gives me a check here. King moves and he wins my queen. And sure, I can make another queen, but he's got a knight and a rook to hold off this extra pawn, and he probably can with good play. So that was the that was a trick in the position. So I was like, I don't want to get into that situation again. Avoid the occasion of sin. So what I did was instead of playing instead of playing the move a7, I took the time to play queen away from this whole dangerous situation, but also attacked his rook. And this is called gaining a tempo in chess, because you made a move that attained your objective, but forced your opponent to make a move which he didn't really want to make or have to make and that which didn't help him achieve his plan. So he had to move the rook away, but that was a waste move because that move doesn't really help him. So that move queen to a3 was called winning a tempo. I won one time with that move. Now I could push, right? So now he tries that, but now I take it because no, there's no checks there that can win my queen. So he takes, I move up here, attack his knight, he drops his knight back. And at this point, I'm like, why is he still resisting, right? Because now I can just go on, make a queen. I've got two queens, and that's easily winning. And so what I did was I grabbed, there's an extra queen at the side of the board. So I grabbed that queen in my hands, and I held that queen. And I was thinking like this, probably in some sort of a position like this. And I was almost about to make a queen. And I looked at the position, and I did, <gasps> I, I saw it. And the problem was if I queened here, then you'd play rook down here, check. And that's actually checkmate, believe it or not. Because this pawn is indirectly defended by that rook, right? So it's an x-ray defense. It's called an x-ray. I can't go here because he's, his pawn's watching that square. I can't go here because his knight's watching that square. So that would have been a really sad way to end this game. I would have lost the game. And that reminds me of um, another spiritual principle, which I'll share with you. Uh, as Jesus said, he who endures to the end will be saved. It's not just enough to endure for a while, but it's important to endure till the end. He who endures till the end will be saved. And there's another passage in Ezekiel which says, uh, when a righteous man turns away from his righteousness and commits iniquity and does the same abominable things that the wicked man does, shall he live? None of the righteous deeds which he has done shall be remembered for the treachery of which he is guilty and the sin he has committed, he shall die. If you play 49 brilliant moves and on the 50th move you make a blunder, you could still lose the game. And chess has taught me that um, that, that can happen to the best of players. You play a great game and just in one move you blow it all away with a blunder because it only takes one move to miss a checkmate and you could be checkmated in one move. And if you miss it, that's it, you lost the game. And none of the great moves that you made before that will be remembered. It's, it's easy to get into a mindset where you're patting yourself on the back saying, look at what I did and how brilliantly I played this game and uh, forget about the actual situation on the board and forget about making good moves in the present moment. And it can be a huge temptation and you can, make, you can slip and fall. And um, therefore, let anyone who thinks that he stands take heed lest he fall. And that's another spiritual principle uh, that we always have to be beware that we can, in fact, fall. And uh, you gotta be watchful till the end. So a, a really healthy attitude to take in um, in th these in life as well as in chess is what Saint Paul says, which is 
Not that I've already obtained this or I'm already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own brethren. I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal of the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. And if anyone had something to look back at, it would be St. Paul, he was a convert. He, he would have said, oh, I performed so many miracles. Um, I evangelized so many people. Um, I, I healed so many people. But he takes a more sober attitude saying, I'm not already perfect. I haven't already obtained um, my prize, but I forget what lies behind me. Even if I played great moves in my past, I got to watch the board right now, and I got to make good moves right now and I, I press on. So that's a good attitude to have, not just in chess, but in life as well. And um, thankfully, I was able to endure to the end in this game, and I saw that checkmate, and I took the pawn instead, and now there is no more checkmate. He brought his knight here to try some tricks, and I could have made a queen here, but then I made a simple move, queen to f3 check, saying, now you can swap off my queen for your rook. And he resigned because he saw what's next. If he trades, then I take back. And then let's say his knight um, um, goes there, I can make a queen, right? And with this queen and extra pawn, I can easily win the game, for example, something like this. I start pushing my pawn and I, now I can even sacrifice my queen and make sure that I queen and then go on to checkmate with the queen. So remember that um, principle of always enduring to the end and have the attitude of always being present in the moment, not just in life, but also, or not just in chess, but also in life. Um, and um, um, you will do well in the grace of God and hopefully you'll do well in chess as well. So that's what I have for you in this first episode. And now I'm going to open it up to any questions that you may have. I'm trying to meet myself. That was, that was pretty nice. Uh, I really like the, the connections you were making. Mm. They're pretty simple. Really straightforward. Really straightforward things in chess. Do you find yourself uh, in every chess match? And I'm making like one big decision or are there like chess matches that you're like, I kind of already know how I'm going to win. Like there's small little decisions to make. Or is there always like one big, like this is going to change the whole game? No, it's always, it always depends on, um, on the particular game and um, how your opponent plays. And, you know, you can never really predict how a game is going to go. So it could be that one big decision changed the game for you but it also could be that a series of minor decisions led to the victory like for example in this game i don't think that there was one single moment i could point to and be like that's what changed the game maybe when he lost his queen you could say that um yeah that was that was a pretty uh, significant moment but you see how much fight he was able to put in even in that situation so it was a series of good moves that, that won the game and also being careful of the trap um, at the end of the game. Nice. 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 All right. I guess looks like um, not everyone could stay this long. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, but uh, they were they were there for quite a while, and yeah. uh, I didn't see any hands raised for um, for questions, so I just went on with the content. Yeah, and uh, I hope to put something interesting for my next lecture. I'm going to upload this on YouTube, uh, nice. and for the next one, I hope to have something interesting. So, uh, see you next time. Yeah. Yeah. Sounds good. Thanks, yeah. Wes. Thanks. Awesome. Take care. Absolutely. Bye. Bye. Bye.